So, how's it everybody? It's uh, with great pleasure that I come here tonight and that I've put together such a small little evening. I, I really like organizing as you probably know and uh, Steph Juncker is my name for those who don't know me. I, um, I travel a lot, I paraglide a lot and I have been doing that for uh, around uh, 25 years. I guess I've racked up about 18,000 flights. Um, I'm firm friends with Carol here. And before I go any further, I want to say a, a massive thank you to those who, who came to the party to help. First, Luke, who is here to operate the computer for me. Uh, Albert, thank you very much for bringing the projector and the laptop. And of course, my dear friends, Olga and Paul, for uh, coming here uh, and uh, hosting me and uh, helping out and cooking. They did the cooking today. I just told them, okay, let's make this. And uh, yeah, thanks all of you guys for coming here and uh, supporting, of course. And let's have a fun evening. So I thought a really nice thing to talk about is to paraglide and to travel. And I know that uh, the Hawkwingers and Kel and uh, uh, not Vic, uh, Kel and, yeah. and Tim organized some tours to Europe. So it's not my intention to try and convince anybody uh, of some other kind of travel. But I travel and I travel alone when I paraglide. And I think it's a theme that a lot of people would appreciate. How do you travel? Where do you travel? And what do you take with you? So, and, and, and what do you combine with you when you go and paraglide? So those were a bit the, uh, the thinking that I thought I'd uh, put together for the talk. Here, uh, a very typical uh, um, alpine flying place. In fact, it's a place I know very well. This is Siliang in Osttirol, in the East Tyrol uh, province. Um, as you guys can see, lots and lots of fields that we take for, for takeoff sites and lots of landing in the valleys. So, go for it, Luke. Let's go to the next pick. Um, here, of course, you get the bigger mountains. So you can also have some really, really big mountains to fly. If you go in Switzerland, if you go in the Himalayas, if you go in the Andes, but sometimes the bigger mountains are also meaning bigger retrieves, bigger risks, bigger faraway places, you know. Um, the, uh, the easier places to fly are, of course, where they, let's open up, uh, <laughs> let's open up the gate, please. I had the remote in my pocket. So, this should be it. Good. Good. So, of course, the easier places to fly are where there are lots of people who fly. And the more reliable places to fly are where it's drier. So, I like the countries of Greece, Turkey, Macedonia. Uh, uh, Morocco, I've never paraglided, but it should be very good to paraglide. But where the rain doesn't come too much, you go to places in the north part of the Alps and you touch a chance with the weather. So, of course, paragliding, what we want when we go and travel and fly is the weather to be shiny and perfect and the thermals to be good every day. And of course, it isn't always like that. So part of your weather decision when you want to go and fly is how flyable is it and how much flying am I going to get on my holiday there? Because it has happened that I've been in, in uh, where I just showed you, you can go to the next picture. And uh, you, uh, you can get there, and this is all you can do. Some culture, visit <laughs> <laughs> Gothic museums, and go for it, look, um, and see beautiful things. Uh, you have to think, let me go to a place where I can really fly. So for me, if I wanted to give South Africans a tip to go and fly somewhere, it would be Iran. Where would you say? Sagefield. Sagefield. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. South, Af <laughs> South Africans uh, who really want to go far can go to Sagefield, you're right. Or maybe to the border of Mozambique. Yeah. So uh, go next. Um, of course, combining paragliding and doing other things is important for me. I can't paraglide all day, every day. I need some other distraction. And some of the other distractions you can think about, of course, it depends how outdoorsy you are and what you like to do. Um, but I love culture, and I love the culture that I can find around Europe, around India, for example, another country I'll talk about, and of course to go to some Muslim countries around. This, for example, is Macedonia, this picture here, and uh, this is at the Lake Ohrid in Macedonia. Now you'll hear me talk quite a bit about Macedonia because it's become quite a place to fly. Very, very cheap, even for us South Africans. And uh, as I mentioned to you a, a moment ago, Iran is the ticket for me because it's extremely cheap to travel and to fly there. So in Iran, you can travel for with a taxi individually for 300 kilometers, it's going to cost you 200 grand. 
you can get accommodation for under 10 rand and you can eat a meal for one rand. Okay, so that's how cheap it is in Iran. Laughably cheap. You can't even believe how cheap you can travel around. But yet, they have uh, beautiful, beautiful things to visit and lots and lots of mosques. And they are Shia Muslims. So they have something different to offer than the Sunni Muslims that we are used to uh, in our kind of contact to the Western world and, and Muslims. Of course, nothing better than going for a short hike or just going for a walk. Or if it is your thing, to hike and fly. Hi, how's it guys? Hi, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Come and join us. Please don't sit there on the outside. Come inside. Come and join us. Take a glass of wine. Take something to eat. Take some snacks. You don't have to worry. We've just started. So. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for waiting. Thank you. Ah, no problem. No problem. Go to the next thing. Thanks. And of course, after flying, there's nothing better than to have a nice beer, a nice chill out, and a nice enjoyment watching the sunset and all that kind of thing. So, another big question that comes up, of course, go on a tour like uh, uh, Kel and Tim organize. That's great. Everything's done for you. Or you can be adventurous and you can think, what should I do? I just land in Delhi and I meet an Indian pilot and I go with a train up to the north of India and I manage to travel around like that and whatever. If you go to a place where the infrastructure is pretty good, you get by really, really easily. So, next one. Thanks. You can go to Iceland. You can travel around Iceland like I did uh, in 2019 and uh, do a whole ring road around the island and see amazing places to fly. So, I haven't said this to you, but I've been in about 100 countries and I've probably flown in about 30 or 40. So, I'm not the last word on traveling and paragliding, but I can tell you for sure the places I've been to that I really like to travel, like I've mentioned, Greece, Turkey, um, Macedonia, and places where Spain, Portugal, where it's dry and where it's hot you generally will have pretty decent flight. Some places are more reputed for flying than others. For example, if you live in the Central Alps, if you live in uh, Munich, or if you live around Germany or Austria or Switzerland, you have to look to places that you can fly in November, December and January. Because those, those are, of course, the thick of their winter months. So, I have been a migratory bird for the last 25 years, besides last year where I didn't manage to get to Europe, Every single year for the last 25 years, I've been spreading my wings, flying to Europe when it's summer there, and flying back here when it's summer here. So I've been basically chasing the summer uh, for all that time. And I go to a lot of different places. In 2019, I was in 26 countries just in that year. And the two new countries I visited were Iceland, as you can see here. And these are some images of Iceland. Um, you can visit glaciers. You can see amazingly beautiful things. And, um, keep going. and you can paraglide anywhere. So there's lots of hike and fly stuff there. And you can see on the right corner of the picture here, you can go up, walk up there, launch your glider on a nice grassy field. I was literally launching my Enzo off some rocky places sometimes because I thought it looked nicer than it did. Got up there and there were really sharp stones and whatever, but I made sure, of course, because no one's watching me and no one knows that I'm there. Albert brought up point a little earlier, or he wrote me when he heard I was doing this talk, please tell me about insurance. So I am not somebody who is big on insurance, so I don't speak for myself. But if you are worried about yourself, or want to of course be sure, insure yourselves properly. And there are very good ways to insure yourself. You can go and join AXA, AXA, uh, in, uh, in um, Kursen. They have a whole central and you can literally just pass your credit card or put online your credit card details and you will have as many months uh, uh, travel insurance as you possibly want for a year or whatever for paragliding and fully comprehensive. You have to give the details of your paraglider that you are flying. Uh, they insure it in one of several ways, but you can insure yourself properly for paragliding when you're traveling. Okay, okay. Of course, sometimes in Iceland they have ridiculously big vehicles. This one uh, uh, for driving on the very glacier. So uh, keep going. And uh, lots of beautiful things. This picture was taken after midnight since it's nearly 24 hours of sun in places like that. As you can see, 
in places like Iceland, where I was on my way to break their record, uh, which was 72 kilometers, I was at cloud base 1800 meters above the ground at 69 kilometers, and I looked behind me, and this is about what I saw, with not a single sign of life, not a road or anything behind me, and I was going no further. So I literally pushed into wind, and I went to land on a suitable road where I could hitchhike back, because I had no radio, uh, no SIM card, and just the hope that somebody was coming to fetch me. So it is like that. There we are. Good. And you see beautiful things in countries like Iceland. Um, you see really, really magic moments, things that are very unworldly for us. Um, and of course, scenery, like that's just gobsmacking because it's very, very different to, to our uh, normal places to fly. So I've taken some of these pictures from Iceland because I find that an absolutely beautiful place to fly. Now I come back and I have to think where this is. This is maybe in Macedonia or somewhere on the edge of the Alps. But as you can see, you can have really, really nice days and it's possible to choose your nice flying places. There are lots of maps to see where you can fly. You can go onto Paragliding Earth, you can go onto Paragliding Map, uh, Paragliding 365, or Burn Air. There's a Swiss guy who comes here called Bernie who uh, has made a very, very comprehensive uh, website showing where you can go and travel and what the conditions are doing at those places every day. Now, you might think, oh, I wonder if anyone is flying when you go to a place like Tegelberg, which is over the castle of Neuschwanstein, which is the castle that's based on uh, the Disney castle. The Disney castle is based on that, on that castle. And you can take off and you can fly directly above that castle and go and land right next to it. It's beautiful. It's like out of a dream. But you are waiting in a queue for two or three hours to take off. And you are watching idiots who are like sorting their very line while you're thinking, no, yes, you've never been to Maitlands before. <laughs> so, so you see people and you want to pull your hair out. Um, yeah, so it gives you a lot of choice to, to places you can go and fly. This particular image in Macedonia, uh, lots of places to land, really easy to get back. And my firm belief that I learned many years ago is if you are going to fly somewhere, part of your day is your retrieve, getting back, meeting people. And if you are never going to fly cross country and worry about how you're going to get back, and if uh, an organized tour, for example, is coming to fetch you, then you're probably never going to go on such an adventure. So such adventures are not for everybody to go to a place, to take off, to fly, and to go off. Before you take off and fly at such places, you can always befriend somebody because South Africans, most of us are pretty open and we don't have problems to talk to people. And you can go to uh, someone and say, hey, how's it going, buddy? Um, uh, you look like you know the place. Butter the person up. The next thing, you're already getting some information. When going to one of these hundreds and hundreds of different flying uh, places in the Alps, always ask for help. Don't ever be somebody who's thinking, oh, I'm South African, we are so good. And we come here and we can just fly anywhere. This is Lake Bled in, um, in uh, Slovenia. A uh, brilliant and beautiful place to fly. On this day, my friend and I flew 100 kilometers and we did a whole big circle around. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Albania is a thousand meter uh, flying site right next to the sea. I guess in Cape Town, we've also got such a thousand meter flying place right next to the sea. But it's really special. You can land there, it's dirt cheap. Um, basically what I'm trying to get to is there are hundreds and hundreds of places to go and to discover and fly. You want to go to expensive places and fly, you go to Japan, for example. Or if you want to say to yourself, hey, I've never been to America, let me go and travel in America. It's quite a nice place to be able to rent a car, get a few phone numbers, and go and visit national parks and nature and uh, go all over the place and fly. This particular picture is taken in, in uh, Greece, and as you can see, about 800 meters above the sea, just coming into uh, land at the beach close to Mount Olympus. Lots of places, lots of easy way to get around, but you have to have the adventurous spirit inside you to be able to say, okay, I take my paraglider and I go. So it brings me to the next point. Where and uh, what do you take with you when you go on such a holiday? My answer is always the absolute minimum. So, stop there. This is the car that I bought for 25,000 Rand about four years ago in Munich. 
and it's in perfect good running order, but I think I've just sold it for about 5,000 Rand. Nothing wrong with the car, with a cracked uh, windscreen, and maybe the brakes needed to be changed. But that would have cost 600 euros or 10,000 Rand in, in uh, Europe, and everything's expensive, and you may as well just chuck it away or sell it for 300 euros and buy another car next year for this kind of money. If you have a friend in Europe and you are keen on doing a more adventurous, bigger trip, this is what I recommend you do. If you have a look, you can see that the car is fitted with a, just above the yellow boxes, is uh, the beginning of the bed. It looks like a hell of a mess because it was just fully loaded there. But the two yellow boxes come out with two yellow boxes behind them and really quite sizable big boxes. That's my kitchen, four boxes like that with a gas stove and a little pull-out underneath the mattress that I've got a little table, a camping chair, um, an e-bike on the back of the car and uh, an air mattress underneath there. So you've basically got a bed, two seats in the front, your music, and you can go and travel. And I travel like this, next. And I never pay for camping. I stop. Do you see that little village there in the distance on the left-hand side and there's some trees and there's the graveyard and the parking lot and I stop there at night and I camp. And no one bothers you. I once stopped in uh, Bergen, the second biggest city of, of uh, Norway. And Norway is an extremely expensive country. So I bought about, I don't know, I, I overdid it. I bought about 8,000 rands worth of alcohol and 8,000 rands worth of food. I smuggled the alcohol. I didn't realize they were really strict about it. I had hidden it all properly. But I got across to Norway. And when people heard how much alcohol I'd actually smuggled with me, they were flabbergasted. But just a cup of vodka for a present for somebody is, they're overjoyed because alcohol is so expensive there. So you bring everything with you to a country like Norway, you road trip around like that with a car, and you will never ever regret to do such a trip. So I spent two and a half months in uh, Norway in 2016, just road tripping around, asking people and using Google Maps to get around from one place to another, um, often just hike and fly. So walking up wherever looked suitable and flying. And sometimes gorgeous flights over glaciers, probably taking off at places that no one had ever paraglided before. Because I've only got a couple of hundred pilots who fly there. So use your imagination. Sometimes you go to flying places like this was a pretty spooky flight for me. This is uh, near Bassano in Italy, but uh, Monta Avena, and it was really strange in the air and very weird and not very nice. So sometimes you'll think, oh, I'm going to do my own thing. Um, I'm the kind of person who, with my 25,000 Rand car, um, not worried that anyone drives the car down the mountain. So when I get up the mountain and I see two people who are just about to drive down in their car, I stop them and I act like, oh, listen, my friend didn't show up and little white lie. Would it be terrible if you drove my car just down to the bottom of the mountain and you sort it and hide the key behind the wheel? And in Europe, nothing gets stolen. The boogeyman's not coming to you in the middle of the night uh, to chop your head off and you can rest assured that you're going to sleep okay and be able to travel okay. So, as you can see, lots of places to fly. Uh, this is in Switzerland. The last one was also in Austria. And when you go to well-established places to, uh, uh, to fly, you generally show up with a lift in the morning and you meet somebody and you say, hey, hi, it looks like a prediction looks okay on paragliding map. It looks like it's pretty decent to fly today. I've looked at the conditions. Everything's basically on the internet can read what you need to and you can say are you going flying today i see you getting ready and the guy will look at you and like it's strange that people just talk to us like this because in europe it's just not done but south africans of course we're a small clip i get it thanks so um where were we so ask people and use the local knowledge and be sure to to hang on to anybody who's uh, more knowledgeable than you at that particular place you go to a place like India, everybody's your friend. In Iran, you cannot buy somebody a drink. Well, you can't buy alcohol, but they drink a lot behind closed doors. And, uh, 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 but you can't invite someone for a meal or a coffee. It's impossible. They won't allow you to. They will only invite you as if you are their brother. And you've never met the person before. A hospitality that's unreal. So I encourage every one of you to really, really think, where do I want to go? What do I want to see in the world? And how long do I want to spend there? Sell your wife, I mean, sell your, uh, sell your house. Uh, <laughs> uh, make sure, sorry, I didn't mean that. That's not a... You won't get anything for your wife. Sorry? You won't get anything for your wife. Okay. Yeah. You don't have a wife. Well, aren't you lucky? Yeah. 
I've never had that. Uh, I've never had that. Prop, I mean, uh, uh, luxury. So, uh, so, um, <laughs> so getting getting it together and thinking, how long am, uh, am I going to go? Because let's face it, if you are going to spend some money on a flight ticket, you may as well make the trip worthwhile. Now, I did touch on what do you take with you? Take the minimum. You don't have to go and spend forty or fifty or sixty thousand rand to go and buy something that's five kilograms lighter than the last equipment because you want to save five kilograms on the luxury of traveling. I travel with a paraglider about this size as my bag and it's a big competition harness glider. The minimum I can get it to is about 18 kilograms and I walk up mountains with it. Sure I suffer and sure I'm a little bit tired and I have to think, hey, the monkey who's walking next to me who has got a six kilogram equipment, he's going to be jogging and whistling while I'm sweating like a uh, blue ass fly here and it's not uh, not nice to do but don't let your equipment bother you don't change your equipment for traveling just take with what you've got a big bag like this people look at you strangely at the airport and you have to look at them regularly and say paraglider so they know oh okay that's what that guy is i thought he was on a mega camping trip or something like that you know so you have to explain it if you have to wear underpants one pair two pairs of shorts two t-shirts, one fleece top, one good jacket, and that's it. Leave the rest behind. A small pair of headphones, your phone, leave the laptop, bring a small book if you have to, but the minimum charges and nothing else. One toothbrush, a bit of toothpaste. You don't need all your hair, makeup, uh, a special shampoo or anything. All in one small bottle, and you can always buy that stuff all over the place. When I went to Norway, as I mentioned, I thought to myself, wow, it's all so expensive, you can um, It's all so expensive there, oh, I'll never be able to afford anything. And I found out that they've also got budget supermarkets, even in Norway. So I could buy fresh produce and fish that was cheaper than in South Africa. You couldn't believe it. So lots and lots of places to visit, lots of nice places to fly. And um, yeah, you just pretty much just got to get out there and think to yourself, this is in Chamonix. Um, I managed to visit there and we had to go up to the higher lift and then the higher lift and we started, we launched at I think 4,600 meters above sea level and uh, flew down with this kind of scenery, uh, a guy, uh, hi, how's it? Welcome. Thank you. So you don't have to sit on the outskirts, those are the cheap seats, you can get an expensive one here. <laughs> Next. Yeah. Glaciers, flying all over the place. If, if big flying, if it's all too intimidating for you and Kel's only ever allowed you to fly at Maitland's, then go and find smaller places to fly. You don't have to go for such big, crazy, mad flying. And anyway, even launching here, you can uh, uh, also uh, start in the early morning and have a long fuffy of one hour down into the valley. So it's all possible. This particular picture is at the Saint Hilaire Festival, the Coupi Car. So uh, we will do another uh, uh, fancy dress festival on the 24th to 27th of uh, uh, February in Wilderness. If you guys can get over there, it's not that far away. Sedgefield you spoke of, there you can make it. And the festival that we organize is based on this particular festival, which has run for 40, 42 years or something like that. This festival is a fancy dress festival where people dress in the maddest stuff you've ever seen in your life. It's also the biggest get-together uh, and expo of paragliding. So every glider manufacturer, every paramotor manufacturer, every harness manufacturer has to be there. If they're not there, then everyone talks and says, oof, they're not here. So you can obviously see the tent city that forms there. Everything's free. There's no reason to. Not have specials at your festival, then. Yeah, Kel should have some specials. I agree with you. These are the mountains behind Saint Hilaire in France, and uh, as you can see from the gliders in the foreground and in the background, if you can just make them out on the left-hand side, there, um, really, really big, big cliffs and beautiful places to fly. Yeah, lion's head. So don't fly lion's head. People come from far and wide to fly there. This picture I took uh, uh, on the first days that I arrived in uh, Austria this year. Here I'm at 3,600 or 3,700 meters above sea level, freezing cold. My gloves and shaking the hands, warm puffy jackets, but it wasn't enough. And I could literally fly 18 kilometers in a straight line without turning, because that's how good the lift was. It was spring conditions and it was just ridiculously good. 
nice valleys, as I said, nice landing fields. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the fields in uh, the home village I have in Osttirol in Austria. And uh, you can see that sometimes some funny oaks show up there and fly nicely and have a good time. Anybody got any questions they'd like to ask or uh, any comments that they'd like to say? Kelly, say something. You're the instructor here. <laughs> You're tired. <laughs> You're tired. What's, 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 what's the sites like in Iran? It's like hot, thermic. Um, it's hot, thermic, but it's not crazy. So I was worried that in Iran I would get there and it would be like 10 and 12 and 14 meter seconds uh, thermals. When I arrived in Iran, I actually planned to go and travel from Azerbaij uh, Iran to Azerbaijan, Armenia, to Georgia, and then fly to Turkey. And I had already a flight. But as I arrived, and my host, as I said, they are extremely hospitable people, said to me, hey, Steph, I signed you up for our nationals. Are you coming? I said, no, 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 I've got a plan to travel. No, rather go and travel around our country, do it properly, and come and fly in Kelmanshah in our nationals. And uh, I took the second place trophy. Thank you very much. They weren't very happy about that. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and besides how high and... Yeah, everything's organized there. I mean, it's very uh, remote. And when you land on the first days, you should land with other pilots. They'll tell you that. Because the military are a bit weird. And But you don't have to worry. <laughs> so land, land without a what? Land without? Yeah, land with some other pilot. Go back a bit. Yeah. So here you can see... In Italy, this is my typical late afternoon setup where I just park my car in a field behind some bushes. Two or three people pass jogging on a small half walk, a walkway, half road. And if the farmer should come and say, what are you doing, which they never do because in Italy they're very relaxed. Just across the border in Austria, some of the farmers are very weird because you go and even just drive on the edge of their fields. So you have all sorts of things in all sorts of places. I'm going to tell you one more funny story of... Uh, uh, of, of being in the north of Croatia, where they had a lot of bombing and war in the ex-Yugoslavian war. And uh, there, uh, the guys were winching me up. I, again, just showed up at a place which was on such a paragliding map. And I thought, whoa, maybe there's some flying going on there. And I showed up at an airfield, and surely there were some guys standing around with some beers. I had finished for the day, but tomorrow morning, uh, they were gonna fly again. And then, of course, in South African style, I said, do you know a place where I could park my car to sleep in the car uh, tonight? No, you don't sleep in the car. You sleep at his place. He's got a lot of space. So I palmed them off. Uh, the youngsters of the family took me out for the night. They, I saw this uh, herbal drink called Palinka. I drank two of them after I'd had a beer. Uh, I promptly fell over because the stuff's so strong and you shouldn't have beer with it or mix anything with it. Uh, I learned my lesson. And the next morning, there we were winching. And just before going to launch and winch, the guy says to me, are you planning to fly cross country? I said, yeah, for sure. I'd like to fly cross country if it's possible. And uh, he says, yeah, that's great. You're going to fly over the town and then go down that main road and just be really careful where you land. And I said to him, what do you mean where you land? I land on a field next to the road. No, no, no. Choose your field. If the fields are well uh, uh, cultivated and they're currently being cultivated and you can see that, then cool, land on them. But if they look like they're scrubby uh, and not being used fields, do not land there. I said, why not? Landmines. <laughs> <laughs> I landed on the road, right? <laughs> right there on the road. So, so there, are, uh, there are some local things to know. Of course, you don't want to fly at a place. Think, oh, I'm South African, I'm cool. I can fly here and I can be absolutely okay. No, no problem, but you're flying straight into airspace, like in Salzburg, a very flight, you know where the Geisberg is, where they start the X Alps, the very first mountain you go up, if you should turn to the left and fly just two kilometers, you're flying into CTR of the airport of Salzburg, which is a very busy airport, and you need to know these things. So when you do such adventures, make sure that you're always asking the locals and checking where you should go. Sometimes, of course, you might think, great idea to go and fly in a certain place. And let me just go around that corner and just go back one more pick. Um, and you'll think, great. And then you find yourself with absolutely no landing and thinking, where am I going to land now? And then you see another pilot. And you think, he's cleverer than you. And he thinks, wow, I'm glad I see another pilot. He's cleverer than me. Yeah. And both of you end up landing right next to uh, the house on the edge of the lake or whatever. Okay. So, next one. Bassano, I might have mentioned it to you. 
Oh, will, do you go there on your tour? Bassano is one of those places where you cannot go wrong if you feel like traveling. You can go to Bassano and join about four or five hundred pilots who fly there every day, and you cannot go wrong visiting a place like that. It's in the north of Italy, right near Venice. You can couple your trip with Venice and a few other really nice places. Or like this, Cal will also recognize that this is Stoll. This is the continuation from Tolmin towards uh, Gemona in Italy. And that's a really, really nice place to fly to. Next. That's from Gemona. This is, of course, competition flying. We all know what this, well, we, we know these pictures from the front of magazines and things. Some of us are sometimes in the thick of this stuff. And you can have a little look at that. I know a lot of places that I've never been to before. Like Valle de Bravo in, it's, uh, in uh, Mexico, or uh, uh, La Paz, the capital of Bolivia. It's at 3,800 meters, it's the highest capital in the world. At the World Championships in Argentina recently, I, I met two brothers who have a paragliding school and a, and a tandem outfit there. And they said, oh, you don't know our place. We fly 350 days a year. I said, you fly 350 days a year? What the hell? So there are places that are very, very regular to fly. Please, of course. I don't think many guys here know it, but we were the sole representative at the at World Champs World. in Tucumán this year. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, uh, just give us a two-minute synopsis of yeah. how okay. you got there. Yeah. From Europe and, and what the compass all about. So so in uh, I went to uh, Argentina because there were two competitions there. One's a paragliding World Cup competition, so the PWC competition that was in La Rioja, and it was very hot and very dry with strong whirlies and strong thermals. But they set tasks just any which way, and there was no landing, like absolutely none. Um, so that was quite daunting and quite crazy. Um, that yeah, that was quite nice. And then, uh, and then I went to uh, Tucumán, which is the World Championships. And the World Championships, for those who don't know, is a Cat 1 competition. That's the highest uh, class of competition you can get. And of course, that's where each person represents their country in the country team. Now, I was the only South African there, and I decided to delay my trip in Europe. I was already in Europe to go to Argentina. I stayed around and farted around in Europe and sailing and doing all sorts of flying in the Dolomites, that last picture you just saw, and killing a bit of time. Uh, before I uh, decided to cruise across to, to Argentina. So there's always something to do. But if a South African wants to fly to Argentina from Cape Town, you're going to fly for a minimum of 45 hours. And the cheaper flights are 70 hours of travel to get there. Don't do it. Don't do it. Take an 8,000 Rand flight with Qatar Airlines, fly in a city close to the Alps if you want to go to the Alps and travel in, in, in Europe. But as I said, if you can, you fly to Dubai. You fly to uh, Tehran and you go and travel around Iran. That's my uh, recommendation for your money goes very, very far to travel today. So the Alps are very nice, but if you don't have a car of your own and you want to rent a car, it's not renting a car like some, some uh, German friends of mine who have just gotten a car for 11 euros a day uh, here in South Africa. They, you spend 30 euros a day every day renting a car, plus you're going to spend uh, between 30 and 40 euros per person for overnighting in a small guest house in Europe, it's quite expensive. So when you go with uh, Carol and Tim to Europe and you do such a package tour, it's probably better, you know, um, for that kind of thing. But that's not, uh, it's not exclusive that you shouldn't do your own adventure if you are an adventurous person who particularly doesn't want to be on a tour. So uh, my personal feel, I, I can't be on a tour. That's, I make everybody mad on the tour bus and, uh, and it's just too restrictive and too time constraint for me so I do, don't do that kind of thing I'd rather be adventurous and I'm also extremely gregarious so I don't have any problem to meet people and get to know them and all that kind of thing go to the next pick and of course you can also buy yourself a 50,000 uh, euro uh, uh, um, van like my friend Christian here has got and you can travel around all like that if you want to so that's what you can do around Europe you can see the camper van in the back that's extremely popular but you don't need that. You can travel with your paraglider, with your tent, and you can arrive somewhere and you can ask, hey, can I just leave my bag here for the day while I go and paraglide to the lift people? No one will say no. Everybody's pretty friendly and nice, especially when it comes to, oh, you're from South Africa? Okay, cool. So there's lots of people who are very accommodating all around. This picture uh, was in the Austrian Nationals this year. So I did fly 12 competitions this year. 
Uh, one was in Barberton and 11 in Europe, and I was meant to fly the portable competition, but you guys might notice that I'm limping strangely because I had a motorcycle accident five weeks ago, and I'm happy to be even standing here and breathing. So. Um, yeah, again, this was the day that I joined the guys from the X Alps. Uh, I was at a paragliding uh, uh, weekend comp uh, Austrian league competition, and the guys were saying, oh, the guys from the X Alps are coming past here tomorrow, and it's like, okay, I changed my plan. So having flexi plans when you're traveling around like this is always a great idea. We went up to uh, Kitzbühel and waited, and Paul Buschelbauer and Marcus Anders landed, right there top landed, which they had to, and uh, ticked off the thingy, and we waited, we weren't in their way, we took off and we flew, and we had a wonderful time flying around and enjoying ourselves with them, and even helping them. Now, it's not allowed to help them, but if you are just in the air, you are just in the air. So. <laughs> uh, help them to cross a valley. This particular lady in uh, uh, Serbia came over and brought watermelons for us and said, here, everybody, watermelons and, and, and sausages and, and, and all sorts of delicious things, all produce because we just landed in her field. Sure. Meanwhile, we'd think, hey, in South Africa, and it's no slate to South Africa, but how do I get out of this electric fence? <laughs> and here a lady brings you watermelon and sausages and please eat and come and drink tea at our place. And you're like, look, I do need to get to a cold beer. So you give ex well, you don't say that, but you say you have to go. You know? So you give her the excuse. But it's amazing how wonderful and nice people are. Um, uh, when I was traveling um, down to Croatia with Ola, uh, we basically were wild camping again in my car and looking for a place to stay for the night. It was all pretty built up and everything. And then I said, we're going to try this little road. And we go to a farm, and the, the, guy, the lady uh, and her kids are just shooing the goats into the shed. And I said, would you mind if you, we stayed here for the night? No problem, no problem. And they disappear, and 15 minutes later, they come back with platters of food and cake and all sorts of stuff. No, 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 we've got food. No, 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 no. And you leave little fossilized shark's teeth, which I always travel with for the kids, and it's all happiness all around, you know. And it often turns into a cultural exchange. So do this adventure, and uh, definitely don't be shy to ask people. Beautiful places to visit. This also in Macedonia, near Lake Ochrid, and... Uh, the, this flying site in Ohrid, uh, no, that's in Gemona, go, go further. Uh, but basically, the, this is also Gemona in, um, what was that, the Polish Open. Okay. This is on the other side of Lake Ohrid. It's dry like this, and you can take off at 7.30 in the morning into 3 meters a second thermals. You can fly across to Albania and back just for fun, and you can have a hell of a nice flight places like that so lots of possibilities don't think that you've never heard of Montenegro but you will be extremely treated if you go to Montenegro and travel there and have a really really nice flight so lots of other very cool little fun experiences as you travel along and lots of good stuff to see yeah. of course you can join the gaggle if you're keen if you should end up somewhere where a competition is going on be part of it, get involved, jump in there and be the wing dummy, ask them which direction they're flying. Hot dry places as I said, this again is Macedonia, uh, took lots of pictures there because it's really really a good place to fly and it's nothing that I'm selling to any of you. Um, in case you're wondering why does this guy do this talk here, it's just simply my pleasure to share with you guys something that I really really love, is to be adventurous, travel and go all around checking mad places to check out. Here's our gold field in Macedonia, really, really nice place, uh, right next to a lake and just four kilometers from the Greek border. So you have to make sure that you uh, don't uh, go a little bit too far because crossing over borders um, and landing there is often quite bad, you see. Um, in fact, I say it, but this is the place that at 7.30 in the morning on the other side of Lake Ohrid and Albania is underneath that cloud there in the distance. Uh, one pilot has actually crossed over from the country of Georgia, I think to where it was, Iraq or something like this, but next, next to Georgia and uh, the military just went crazy. You know, who is that guy? He's coming to prison, this and that, just from paragliding across an international border. What's it to anybody? To you and me, we smile, we laugh, and we think they're crazy, but some people don't see the humor in this kind of thing. 
So again, this is the landing field, or not the official landing field. I'm very seldom landing at uh, official landing fields. I choose any which field to land in. It's always part of the adventure. But it's always very nice to be able to find a way up the mountain. And as I said, if you ever worry about where you're going to land or how you're going to get back when you are going flying on an adventure like this, you should not even do it. Because it has to be a song and a prayer. And as I said, in a country like Iran, or you go to a lot of countries where the motorcycle taxi is popular, you're on the back of a bike and you're back at your car for 10 Rand or 15 Rand very, very quickly and easily. Keep going. Took too many pictures. Any other questions or comments? This is the official side of the Lake Ockrid uh, where uh, Bobo and Martin um, fly a lot. And it's really a place I can recommend that you guys go and visit. So uh, Macedonia would also be really, really high on my list of extremely reliable, great places to get some nice flying in. This is Bobo. He is uh, Martin uh, Jovanovsky's brother. A super nice guy. And he is, in fact, I took this, I took this picture as part of it because this is the oldest um, establishment uh, uh, with anything that still exists uh, in the world um, where people lived in a commune as such. The, these are um, little fishing villages where they found six and eight thousand year old pieces of wood which are still stilts for those villages and they've done reconstructions there and to read and to see this kind of um, sorry, excuse me, much older than that. I think 16,000 years old is the, is the pieces of wood that are still standing there from people long, long ago. Even Neanderthal uh, man was already busy there. All right, that's the takeoff site uh, at this very, very hot and 7.30 in the morning flying place. It's mad to hear that you should wake up at 6.30 because you've got to rush out the door and go flying. But when you get there and you go up in a three, three meter a second thermal at 7.30 in the morning, right under the good place. Like Iran, you make sure you're not there at 2 in the afternoon because it will be pretty strong and, and long. Keep going. And that's going to pretty much bring me to the end of the talk. Uh, if anyone's got any comments or anything, you can see all the pilots down below there all struggling for some height while others are way up in the stratosphere here. Uh, this is what I like. Sometimes you don't know where you're going when you're flying in the distance, but what the hell, just go for it. Competition gliders, of course, this is my stuff. I really, really like it. I, I love competing in paragliding. If any of you have never flown in a competition before, think to come and uh, join us in Barberton, for example. That's a really nice low-style competition. or even portable, it's not too crazy. It's a nice place to go and to fly. Um, competing in paragliding uh, definitely, definitely furthers your game and gets you much, much better than uh, you thought you would be if you, if you had never competed. Additional baggage is the last thing that I was asked by uh, Albert to mention. I never pay for extra baggage. Never. If you only allow 23 kilograms, make sure that your baggage weighs 23,97 and uh, it doesn't matter. You get it in. Um, there's a very good way to travel with a moon bag and a hand luggage, which is oversized, plus your laptop bag, which you're allowed to take and everything hidden in your pockets, your instruments and everything heavy, and you go through with much more than you. I can travel with literally 60 kilograms of stuff, so don't pay for additional baggage unless you need to. Is it safe to have your glider in your cargo? Yeah. Because I know sometimes it's very cold there or they heat it up because... No, no. No, no, it's good. So, uh, so they, uh, a lot of people think that uh, the stuff is frozen in the cargo or whatever, but it's actually temperature controlled inside there, so... So, um, only once ever have I had a, a paraglider that's disappeared off an airline, and that was in 1998, I think, a uh, long time ago. So, sometimes the valleys look like, where am I going, and where am I going to land? Uh, this was in Norway. Yeah, go on. And, of course, and this is in Slovenia. Sometimes the rocks look quite, quite mad. This is probably a 300-meter drop from the top of the white down to the bottom. And of course, sometimes you're over no landing zone and you think, is that where I have to land in that tiny little field in the distance? But of course, that's part of flying, you know. Yeah, nice little places. Uh, down, down below us at the, uh, about here is where the takeoff is, or just a little higher up about here. And pilots come there in the afternoon. Here you can see one pilot in the air. 
Um, I took the shot from the air just before I top landed there for the third or fourth time, much like the map of Africa. And uh, pilots come there in mass in the afternoons. You just need to know where it is and ask around and, and, and get some network and speak to some people and whatever it is. A uh, landing field in Turkey in Aksaray where I flew a PWC competition earlier this year with a massive volcano that's also up to 4,000 meters high. A very, very nice place to fly. Very dry, very hot. And if you go to a country like Turkey, uh, which is also very high on my list of places to fly, you can't go wrong with the flying there. Everyone knows early dinners, uh, which is uh, between 1,700 and 1,900 meter takeoffs, and you land down at the beach, and you can do some SIV courses with uh, Jockey Sanderson, for example, or the like, and you can have a really, really great time traveling. And then you go and do the hot air balloon experience in Cappadocia. And this is not to be missed. This has cost up to 150 euros uh, in the past. Now they just charge 60 euros to do this since there's so little tourism there. I did it for the third time in my life uh, now in 2021. And it's unbelievable. A full hour on the balloon and it's just gorgeous. Steve, just speak to me. The exchange rate for the, for the rampant inflation in Turkey is at the moment making it absolutely cheap. Yeah, yeah, it's quite cheap. First, yeah. The first time I went to Turkey, I paid 5 rand 50 to a Turkish year. Yeah, yeah. It's less than a rand at the moment. Yeah. We're just robbing it about the same. Yeah, yeah, I mean... So, in, so, 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 so uh, of course, accommoda accommodation, I thought you're making is very good. It's accommodation. Yeah. In an inflation scenario, will keep a rest. But street food and, and all the other stuff, tourist accommodation, renting cars and so on. Very cheap, yeah. Very cheap. No, I mean, really? just, yeah, a lot.